Joining us right now is Nigel Travis. He is executive chairman of Duncan Brands. His new book that's out today is called The Challenge Culture, Why the Most Successful Organizations Run on Pushback. Nigel, thanks for being here today. Becky, nice to be with you all. We appreciate the donuts. We appreciate the book. Uh, but what, what does that mean, that the best corporations run on pushback? Well, it really means that uh, in any organization, it doesn't have to be a big business. It doesn't have to be even a... It, it could be a not-for-profit. It, it could be a sports organization like I run in London. It allows people to have their say, to push back. And the whole idea is to get the best business solutions you can and to build a business that is sustainable. And over the last nine and a half years, we've done that in Duncan. Everyone has a say. Everyone's encouraged to have a say. And, and it's very much about creating not just the challenge part of the culture, but the culture at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the book's called The Challenge Culture, but I divide it into two. One is to push back the challenge, and secondly is creating a very positive environment or the culture. And I think a lot of people out there think culture is one of those things you go down to the hardware store and say, I'll have some nails and a culture. It isn't. It's something that lives all the time. It's something you have to create. And, and it's a very positive environment. But right at the heart of it is this, this permission to push back and say you've got a different view. That sounds like decentralization, like you don't want yes men surrounding you. Why, why is that important? What are a couple of examples, or at least one example, of where that decentralization, allowing people to push back, made you do something differently than you would have done otherwise? Well, a good example is at Duncan, I've run these uh, meetings called coffee chats, which are for people down the organization. And we always describe it as though it's a a TV talk show. You can say anything you want about anything, and, and it's not a Q&A of Nigel. So one good example is we changed our whole family leave policy as a result of those discussions. I think that's a really good example of where we changed the culture. We realized we were causing problems for a lot of our employees, so we changed it. But we listened to people down the organization. And I wouldn't say, Beckett, it's necessarily decentralization. I think it's actually empowering people to have a say so you could have a centralized organization or a decentralized organization it's more the approach that you take well, it's bottoms up right. versus top down yeah yeah it's very much so but can, you know when people talk about challenging each other it can sometimes even though you want to talk about keeping a positive environment and you say it creates a positive environment the idea of challenging each other can sometimes be less positive right i mean they can, it, it, it can be done it well i talk a lot it has to be done in a civil way i mean it can get really nasty I, I actually think, having been on this show many times, yes. you guys actually create a very positive ch challenge culture because you challenge each other. We do. It can be challenging, too. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, but you do it surrounded by humor. I mean, many times Joe will poke fun at you or poke fun at me, as he's done many times, pointing out how I nearly killed myself on the snowmobile. And I just wanted, I, I, we were talking to Polaris. Would you? I love snowmobiles, but you are a living example of what can go wrong. And my 13-year-old son has never forgotten it. and it Turned it over on, on himself. Yeah, right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> Which is possible if you're not careful. Yeah. But yeah. the point is, I think you have to allow people to make fun of you a little bit. Right. And, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've been very successful at Duncan, because that's the environment we have. I mean, you're not the God Almighty. You are someone who can be approachable, someone who's authentic. And I think it's the environment that's so important. Nigel, you developed this theory in part from your experiences in places like Blockbuster. What yes. did you see happen there, and what did that teach you? Well, Blockbuster was probably the greatest fun I had in 10 years I was there. Um, uh, we did a lot of good things every day. I'd yeah, wake you did up. a hell of a job there, Nigel. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, did it. I left in uh, 2004, <laughs> Joe, so it could push back. Um, there's, there's a challenge with yeah, humor. But, but, the thing we missed is we had all these technologies coming at us just about every day. We regarded Netflix at the time as a small regional chain that probably wasn't going anywhere. We could have bought it for 50 million. Oh. Last time I looked, it was worth 159 billion. Uh, Reed Hastings has done a great job. We actually came after Netflix, was taking market share, but subsequent to me leaving, we had activist shareholders come in, they focused on retail, thought the internet wasn't going to be a big thing took all the investment away, and as Joe says, the end result was Blockbuster went bankrupt in 2010. There's one left, supposedly. 
There's one left in Oregon. In Oregon. Yeah, I mean, Alan Payne, who ran the stores in Alaska, a great franchisee, he closed his doors a couple of weeks ago. Oh. But I still believe that Blockbuster could be here today with games. I mean, look at how GameStop has continued. Right. Yeah. But the whole point of the Blockbuster um, lesson, I think, Becky, is you've got to look forward, you've got to anticipate the future, and you've got to challenge the status quo as it is today. I think we did that most of the time. Probably with Netflix, we didn't do it early enough. You were CEO at Papa John's, too. You got any advice that you would offer them based on what they're going through at this point and what you've learned along the way? Well, I was there for te uh, four years. We had a great run while I was there. It was interesting working with John, as you might imagine. Um, and, and what it did do was train me for my next CEO job. I think my advice, and I, from what I hear, the board are doing this, is you have to try and get the franchisees, management, and the board on the same place. And my understanding through sources, as you would say, mm -hmm. is that the board met with the franchisees recently. I think that's a really good step. You need to have a plan because franchisees, as I say in the book, focus on one set of economics. The company focuses on another. Bridge that gap. And I think the board has done that. So I think they've taken the very important first step. And I think they have to get behind their CEO, support it, work with the franchisees because it's a fantastic concept that John invented in a broom cupboard. Um, probably the best chain pizza out there. So I think it can get back to being a great company. Nobody's getting Papa John tattoos, okay? Domino's is right up there with chain pizza. But in Russia, yes. In Russia. But here's a true story, Joe. The yep. day we bought our English football club, Leighton Orient, we have several fans with the day and my partner and my name on their bodies. So it's not only in pizza that happens. And you don't even right. have to give them free pizza for life we, to get No, that. we just have to hopefully keep winning and we're unbeaten so far this year.